So welcome everyone to Landmark Chambers uh, webinar on immigration detention and update. Um, we're obviously very pleased to see so many of you joining the session today um, and hope you'll find it all useful and informative. A um, couple of housekeeping points. Uh, first of all, your, your microphones are automatically muted. Uh, you don't need to do anything to adjust that. I don't think you can. Um, your video should have been turned off when you came on. I think you have the capacity to turn them on, but we ask that you, you don't just because it's going to affect bandwidth and be a bit distracting. And obviously there's a hundred plus people on the call, so it becomes a bit, uh, um, doesn't serve much uh, purpose to have too many. Um, questions. Um, we're going to manage questions via the chat function, which will be for many of you, if you've got the same setup as I have at the bottom of the screen, in some cases a bit different, some cases in the top right or something. Um, so for obvious reasons, we won't have audio questions because it just won't be manageable. Please do ask questions via the chat function at any point. Um, what we normally do uh, is we have a Q&A session at the end um, and that gives us time to look at the questions whilst others are speaking. We're going to have to modify that slightly today because Alex Goodman who's speaking first has some childcare issues. Um, so Alex is going to try and take some questions after immediately after his talk. Um, if you don't manage if you have a question for Alex or for relating to his talk and don't manage to ask it in time, or if Alex just is unable to, to take it in the, at that point, um, I mean, I'll do my, I or the other panellists, but me, I will do my second rate best to, to field any questions relating to his talk at the end. But in any event, we will pick up all of the questions later on. We'll go through the chat function and we'll post something online where we try to ask people's, answer people's questions at that point. Um, we'll try and take as many questions as we can today, but we may or may not get to all of you. Um, this webinar is recorded and both the slides and the recording will be uploaded to the website later on. Um, if you have any issues about that, you can contact Anna. If your connection is lost, the best thing to do is just to log out and then log back in again, or sorry, log into the call again. Uh, and that's it. Um, so, my name is Tim Bewley uh, and I'm joined by three excellent speakers today. We've got Alex Goodman, I'll introduce him now, Alex Goodman, who's going to talk about a hot topic around immigration detention and bail arising from, on the one hand, the new statutory bail regime and on the other hand, various recent um, uh, higher court decisions relating to that. Alex will be known to many of you as someone who does a lot of really excellent work in this field and also related immigration and human rights work. Um, then we'll have Hafsa Masood, who's also very experienced in this field, acting for a range of clients. Uh, and I noted, looking at her CV, I noted the recent victory of hers acting for a claimant in relation to the Secretary of State's failure to properly serve a notice of curtailment of leave, success in a judicial review claim. And I think she's acting ne next week, I think, in a big case about the lockdown regime at Brook House. Um, Hafsa also has a very interesting wider international practice, which I would have thought would complement this kind of work very well. Uh, and she's going to be giving us a general case law update. Uh, lastly then, we've got Ben Fulbrook, who's going to give us, um, I think, an invaluable tour through the case law on the complicated and rather burgeoning case law on damages for immigration detention, looking at the key cases. Um, ben is an up and coming junior in Chambers who's acted successfully for a range of immigration clients in immigration appeals, JRs and detention claims. And he's also, and I'm very glad to have him, my co-trainer for ILPA, on immigration judicial review in the upper tribunal. Um, okay, last word from me. This is a general immigration detention update. Um, we, Ch Chambers, myself and Graham Denham gave a session about a month ago now, specifically on the issues arising from COVID-19 and immigration detention. That's not the focus today. And for example, Hassler's talk's not going to be updating specifically in relation to the cases in that field. Um, but I mean, if you've got some questions about that, I'm assuming there's time, we have to try and field them at the end. So don't feel kind of that that's completely shut out, but it's not the focus today. Okay, uh, that's all from me. Um, and I shall hand over to Alex. Alex. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've only got about 15 minutes for each talk. So I thought I'd just talk about one case, which is, as uh, Tim's indicated, quite a hot topic at the moment. Uh, it's a case called Katie against the Secretary of State for the Home Department, which I argued uh, for the claimant last week. And it's all about Schedule 10 to the Immigration Act. Uh, so I'm going to give the gist of that case. Uh, 
it was argued before Mrs Justice Lang in a remote hearing last week, but she has res reserved judgment. It will help to have paragraphs 1 and paragraph 10 of Schedule 10 to the Immigration Act 2016 uh, before you, and that's the, uh, the, the main provisions I've just included on that single slide there. Uh, the case was argued for the defendant by Robin Tam QC and Emily Wilston, for the intervener, Bail for Immigration Detainees, uh, Laura Dubinsky, Anthony Vaughan and Eleanor Mitchell acted, and I acted leading uh, Matthew Fraser for the claimant. I prepared this talk as a, a written paper as well, and that will be made available to you, the delegates, by email uh, on your email address provided. Um, so necessarily what I'm going to give is only a snapshot of, of an argument that obviously took place over the course of a day. Uh, I've got a short time to try and um, summarise it to you. The claims are series of uh, is, is part of a series of claims. All the previous claims have been settled favourably to the claimants. The judgment's likely to be subject to an attempt to appeal whichever side succeeds uh, because it raises an important legal issue about the scope and limits of the powers of the Secretary of State for Home Department and the First Tier Tribunal to impose conditional bail under paragraph one of Schedule 10 to the Immigration Act 2016. And it's also important in terms of the scale of its impact. Uh, Pierre Maclouf of BID uh, gave evidence on behalf of BID uh, that the total number of individuals subject to conditional immigration, or ba immigration bail is likely now to be in excess of 90,000 people. So Schedule 10 bail now affects a large number of people. Uh, it's worth recalling at the outset that the Immigration Act 2016 abolished temporary admission, which was a form of uh, form of status that people could be on who weren't granted leave. So anyone who does not have leave or some form of status is now on bail unless they are simply at large. And the question at issue in the claim is whether a person may remain on bail where it would be unlawful to exercise a power of detention in respect of them. The most obvious circumstances in which that might arise are where to detain a person would offend against the Hardy or Singh principles. For example, because there's no realistic prospect of removing them to another country in a reasonable period of time. So most of you on this seminar will be aware there are many people from countries to which removal is difficult in this position. Algeria, Morocco, Eritrea, China, Palestine, Iran. They're all notable examples of countries where removals can be very difficult to achieve. And that was the position in Mr. Mr. Katie's case. Uh, he is the Home Office has been unable to establish uh, that he is a, a national of the country from which he came. Uh, and so the question of whether a person can be on bail, even though they cannot then be detained for breach of bail, uh, would arise in these Hardy or Singh type cases. And they might also arise uh, where it would be unlawful to detain a person, for example, because of their vulnerability or because they're a trafficking victim or because they're a disputed minor. So a further issue in this claim is whether then there are independently implied limits on the exercise of the bail powers. So in Mr. Katie's case, the question arose whether there comes a point when it's unreasonable to maintain bail any longer, assuming there is a power to, to bail a person who can't be detained, but simply because they may have stayed so long on bail, whether uh, to resolve the consequential limbo uh, the, 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 ex the limits of the, of the power to detain are exceeded. Previous case law under the old system where there was temporary admission suggests that uh, despite the harshness of leaving somebody in that kind of limbo, a near indefinite form of temporary admission was not unlawful. So just to give you a brief, very short account of the facts. Uh, Mr. Katie had been in the UK uh, since 2008. The claimant was released from immigration detention on bail by order of the First Tier Tribunal in January 2011, subject then to electronic monitoring, and has been on bail in the nine and a half years since that time. In that time, his bail conditions have been relaxed to the extent that he is no longer subject to electronic monitoring, he's permitted to work, and he has committed no further offences. In that time, it's also become clear that there is, uh, to use Lord Dyson's words from paragraph 103 of Lumber, uh, no realistic prospect of deportation within a reasonable period of time. And so were the claimant to be detained today, he would seek a writ of habeas corpus, as Mr Hardy or Singh did, or judicial review of his detention on that basis, and he would be released. And it's quite obvious, said Mr Katie, that a court would say there's been no progress over the last decade 
what's changed, why is there now a realistic prospect of deportation in a reasonable period? And then Wooden could be no answer to that. His detention would not be compatible with the Hardy or Singh principles. So the defendant didn't dispute that. She said she had never even thought about detaining him. In, so the background to this case, in B. Algeria against Secretary of State for the Home Department in 2018, the Supreme Court, and before that, the Court of Appeal, recognised that the term bail was a legal term of art with hundreds of years of consistent meaning. The Supreme Court held in that case that because Mr B could not be detained, because he'd reached the end of a Hardy or Singh limitation on the power of detention, he therefore couldn't be held on bail, because bail under the Immigration Act 1971 could only subsist where there was an underlying power to detain him. And that, the court held, reflects the ordinary meaning of bail, the common law meaning over hundreds of years. But it went on to hold that it would be possible to have a form of bail that didn't uh, have to coexist with a, 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 corollary, a corollary of a, a power of detention, a correlative power of detention, but that the clearest possible words would have to be used in the statute so as to exclude the ordinary understanding of, of the meaning of bail. Uh, it's a remarkable judgment because it distinguished a very long-standing case of Kadir on the grounds that Kadir applied only to the situation under temporary admission. Uh, and that's very different to a situation where a breach of bail can result in a power of detention being exercised. And the reason for the distinction was the Supreme Court held that it's a fundamental principle of the common law that in enacting legislation, Parliament is presumed not to intend to interfere with the liberty of the subject without making such an intention clear. And so the claimant in Katie is arguing that a grant of conditional immigration bail now under the Immigration Act 2016 that's replaced the regime that was considered in B. Algeria is also a bail power that's derivative of a power to detain. Thus, it's, all, it's an ordinary form of bail. And for that reason, a writ of habeas corpus may issue so as to bring bail to an end. Not very common, but it has happened in the history of the common law. And so the writ will also issue to mark the exhaustion of the underlying power to detain from which the bail power derives. So the corollary of a breach of bail is that a person may be re-detained. And indeed, the claimant relied centrally on the argument that under Schedule 10, where a person breaches a condition of bail granted by paragraph 1-2, we've got that provision in the slide, to Schedule 10, the first tier tribunal or the Secretary of State must, according to paragraph 10, subparagraph 12 of Schedule 10, must detain them under the power to which they are liable to detention. And so the claimant argued it's clear, it's, that, that is a clear indication that Schedule 10 creates an ordinary form of bail. And the significance of that is if it creates an ordinary form of bail, then where a person cannot be detained, they cannot be on bail. B. Algeria doesn't rule out that Parliament could bring into existence what is described as an extraordinary form of bail, which operates not along the lines of ordinary bail, but more like a legal status equivalent to the now repealed temporary admission status. And indeed, the contention in B. Algeria was that bail under Schedule 2 to the Immigration Act 1971 did operate in just such a way, but that argument was rejected. The Supreme Court said clearest possible words are needed, and so the argument now is has Parliament in Schedule 10 used the clearest possible words so as to create an extraordinary form of bail whereby uh, a person can be liable to detention but not in fact uh, capable of being detained. Uh, so that was the that's the issue. The claimant was supported by bail for immigration detainees and contended the power to impose conditional bail cannot lawfully be exercised unless the person concerned could be lawfully detained. Uh, so essentially the claimant's arguing that Schedule 10 mimics the findings of the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal before it as to the function of bail in the common law. The Secretary of State contended uh, that the imposition of conditional bail is not predicated on a power to lawfully detain a person under immigration powers. Uh, it was common ground that if there's no power to detain, so that's similar to a situation like in the Tante Lam case, then there is no power to grant bail either. But the question the Secretary of State put was whether uh, uh, the exercise of a power of detention being unlawful, nonetheless, uh, the power existing, there could subsist a power uh, of bail. Uh, 
The claimant also argued that if his interpretation of the statute as a matter of common law is not correct, then whether what results is incompatible with Article 5 of the ECHR, because Article 5.1 permits detention only in accordance with the procedure prescribed by law and only for one of the prescribed purposes. And Article 5.1f sets out that detention with a view to deportation is one such prescribed purpose, but it's well established under the Article 5 jurisprudence that it roughly mirrors the hard or sing principles. And so where well, there's no realistic prospect of deportation in a reasonable period of time, detention in the meantime is not with a view to deportation. Uh, cases such as Mikolenko establish that. So consequently, if the statute permits bail and in turn permits detention for breach of bail of a person who is not liable to be detained because in turn there's no realistic prospect of deportation, then the scheme is incompatible with Article 5. So assuming the claimant's right and that where he can't be detained, he can't be on bail, uh, what happens next? And the claimant argued that the only statutory alternative now that temporary admission has been uh, repealed is what is provided for in Section 3 of the Immigration Act 1971, a form of limited leave. And the claimant argued that limited leave is what the Supreme Court said must be granted to Mr George in the case uh, before it in which he could not be deported. Uh, and they approved successive grants of conditional limited leave for six month periods. And the claimant said, well, in substance, that's a little different to bail because it can be granted subject to conditions that control residence, control work and study, prohibit recourse to public funds and require reporting. So why not grant successive grants of limited leave? Uh, the conditions attached to immigration bail additionally include electronic monitoring and a possible curfew condition, but particularly in this client's case, uh, neither was imposed in any event. So there's every reason to suppose that Parliament expects limited leave subject to conditions to be the mechanism rather than an endless form or an indefinite form of bail. And as a matter of regularity, or more fundamentally the rule of law, the claimant submitted it's not acceptable for a person to be left in a netherworld without any form of status. However, the Secretary of State said that was the alternative. If the person can't be on bail, then they're simply at large uh, without any form of status. So in other words, uh, they'd be put from the Secretary of State's position in actually an inferior position because there'd be fewer controls, in fact, no controls if the person simply at large. They, they couldn't be required to reside anywhere or to report, etc. So slightly perverse argument for the Secretary of State, but that was the position taken. Um, I'm going to try and wrap up here because we were so short on time, but in the paper I set out the provisions uh, at greater length and um, I can think just take any uh, quick questions um, if there are any otherwise I'm going to hand back to Tim to um, uh, pass to the next speaker thank you very much uh, great thanks very much Alex um, I, I, I can't see any questions on the chat function um, I'm just wondering while Alex is here, if I might ask him a question in that case. Yeah, sure. Know, just do it very quickly because I just want to tease out this really interesting argument. Um, I can see completely see the kind of the legal force of the argument, as I understand the case law, and I can completely see the attraction, especially in a case like your, especially in a case like the fact of your client. But is the logic of it that if you're right for this chap? then you would be right for anyone whose immigration detention is unlawful. So when the court finds that someone's detention is unlawful under Hardy or Singh, you know, not because there's no chance of removing in the long term, but because it's not currently lawful to detain the person, that, that they don't get bail, they get leave, because that's quite, if that's right, then that will be a tremendous result, but it, it is quite an ambitious... Yeah, so uh, that was one of the way, arguments put... Yeah. Go on. yeah, so that was one of the points put for the Secretary of State, that it because the hard you'll sing limits uh, can, can drift in and out, then you're creating a situation where the bail power also drifts in and out of being usable, uh, to which the claimant's response was, so be it. Uh, yeah. That's the way the parliamentary scheme works. Um, that is the kind and, of logical, that's the, the force of your argument. It does go that yeah. far. And, 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 and in a sense, the question which arises is when Parliament with, uh, withdrew or repealed temporary admission, was it intending to replace that with bail for everybody indefinitely as temporary admission used to operate? Or 
in offering limited leave is that the alternative and if limited leave is the alternative subject to all those conditions why not use that i mean it's de facto a form of bail subject to heavy conditions anyway uh so uh is that such a problem uh, as opposed to putting people on bail where the only mechanism for enforcing bail or the primary mechanism for enforcing bail has to be redetention under paragraph 10 12 uh, and if that's not available, then it makes a bit of a nonsense of, of a person being on bail as ordinarily understood. Um, and so the court has to grapple, do we, do we accept that a very strange creature has been formed where a person can be on bail yet not detained for breach of bail, even though a power is provided for that in the statutory scheme? Um, we, just so it's, it's very... come in. we just had a question come in in the meantime, so I'm, I'm going to, just because I know we'll push the time, would section... 70, section three of the 1971 Act applies. So I think she means, in other words, would you have to grant people grant someone leave to remain in a case where a person had a deportation order in force, but yeah. he said not been removed, but presumably where they've got a deport order in force, but they are um, their detention is is unlawful. Yeah. So that that is a good point, and that's um, that is one of the difficult consequences because. Uh, the deportation order requires the person to leave but you have to realize here that the the premise here is that they can't leave because that's that's the whole hard you seeing point um so that is a difficult uh snack because it may be that you had to you'd have to revoke the deportation order put them on leave until such time as it can be remade and that's exactly what happened in the case of george in the supreme court where he couldn't be removed in the meantime because of a situation in his home country the deportation order was revoked. The consequence that was an issue in, in the George case in the Supreme Court was that the making of a deportation order had cancelled the indefinite leave to remain he had prior to the making of the deportation order, because that's its statutory effect under Section 5. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, well, so be it, that's how it works. Your leave doesn't revive after revocation. And so what happens after you revoke the deportation order? They said, successive grants of limited leave of six months subject to conditions if at such point as he can be deported again he always remains liable to deportation a new deportation order can be made so the supreme court said don't be afraid of having to of being capable of remaking that order the, one doesn't have to leave these kind of fossilizing statuses you can be much more flexible so this really follows on from that george case about how the immigration um regime is not used flexibly right. it's, it's all treated as a once and for all set of decisions but the parliament has given the Secretary of state a lot more flexibility in the way it uses its powers than than it actually operates okay thank you um i'm not seeing any more questions and i'm a bit anxious to get on with um yeah. thank you very much yeah. sessions. so thanks very much so there's a lot of really interesting food for thought and i'm going to hand straight over to have so who's i think now got control of the screen. Thanks. Sorry, it took a, took a while for me to find the unmute button. Um, I hope you can hear me. Good afternoon. Um, I'll be discussing, uh, considering and discussing some recent cases. Um, first, um, I'll be considering a recent Court of Appeal decision um, on the approach to be taken um, in deciding the grace period um, to afford uh, the Secretary of State in order to make practical arrangements for release once um, detention ceases to comply with the hard or sing principles. Uh, and in my experience, this is an issue that does arise time and time again. Um, particularly in um, foreign national offender cases where, as you all know, um, arrangements for release tend to be more complicated. So from there, I'll move to considering um, some recent cases, including um, DN Rwanda, um, on the impact of public law errors on um, the lawfulness of detention. Um, and then I'll end on a procedural note. Um, and um, what should happen to a judicial review claim um, where um, the uh, detainee is released before the hearing of a substantive claim. Uh, there were some observations about that in a recent case called Zede Pakistan. Um, as Tim said, um, I won't be addressing 
um, recent policy developments and case law uh, uh, to do with COVID. Um, if you missed um, Tim and Graham's excellent seminar on that quite recently, then uh, as I understand it, the materials are available um, on the website. Sorry. Uh, so um, the grace period, first of all, what is it? Um, well, by now it's well established that um, once detention ceases to comply with the Hardy or Singh principles, uh, a detainee doesn't have to be released instantly, um, come what may. Um, it's recognised um, that the Secretary of State can consider um, the, the risks, for example, risk of absconding or risk of harm. Uh, and conversely, it, it won't obviously or necessarily be in the detainer's, detainee's interest to simply be ejected from the detention centre, particularly if they've got nowhere to go. So the grace period is the time that's allowed to the Secretary of State um, to take stock of the change of circumstances. So this will um, typically be a development which affects timescales. So maybe, for example, that the detainee has um, made an asylum claim. Uh, well, the grace period in principle affords the Secretary of State some time to take stock of what that means for timescales for removal. Um, and then if, if uh, she decides to release, to make suitable arrangements for release, for example, um, identifying uh, appropriate release conditions, securing suitable accommodation and so on and so forth. Uh, so the significance of the grace period uh, for the lawfulness of a detention is that detention only becomes unlawful once that grace period expires. So it, it's not unlawful from uh, the, instant, the instance that the um, a detention ceases to comply with the Hardy or Singh principles, it becomes unlawful when uh, that grace period expires. Um, so the vexed question is really um, how long? Now, uh, some of the earlier cases, including FM, um, referred to um, the Secretary of State being um, uh, uh, permitted a short period of grace. Um, the courts have been unwilling to specify a, a, a sort of time period um, uh, or to set a long stop. Um, historically, periods permitted have been relatively short, um, uh, days um, up to a couple of weeks. But there has been a tendency in recent years for, for the periods to increase. Uh, and as I alluded to at the start, uh, the problem is particularly um, acute in foreign national offender cases um, where Typically, um, a, a condition um, of a foreign national offender's license will be um, that their residence um, uh, address needs to be approved by um, probation. Secretary of State typically takes um, time to both source an address and then for there to be approval from um, the relevant agencies, uh, including probation. Um, in a case that I was involved in last year called DM Tanzania, um, the High Court um, suggested that a longer grace period might be justified in cases where the nature of the accommodation required um, placed particular burdens on providers. Uh, and that was a foreign national offender case. And, and there was mention in DM Tanzania of, of a grace period of up to five to six weeks. Um, although uh, the court did make the point that that was likely to be at the very outer reaches of, of what can fairly be described as a, as a grace period. Um, now, the issue of um, grace periods and in particular what the appropriate length is um, recently came before the Court of Appeal in a case called AC Algeria. Uh, again, this was a case um, concerning a foreign national offender and as, and as we'll see in a moment, um, it, it did have a rather sorry history. Um, and there's nothing particularly earth shattering um, in um, uh, AC Algeria, but um, it has been a while since this particular issue has come before the court, uh, higher courts uh, and there are some very useful observations um, including the reminder that once um, detention ceases to comply with the Hardy or Singh principles um, the Secretary of State is continuing to detain on borrowed time. After all um, what she's enjoying is a period of grace and for that reason the court emphasised that increased energy and rigour should be required of the Secretary of State in relation to such final periods of detention. Um, the court went on to say that once any of the second, third or fourth principles are breached, 
um, further detention is lawful only for a reasonable period to put in place appropriate conditions for release. Well, that begs the question, what's a reasonable period? The court said the appropriate duration of the period of case uh, is dependent on the facts, uh, and the relevant facts include the history and the risks to the public, which um, of course will be a uh, particularly significant factor, at least from the Secretary of State's point of view in, in foreign national offender cases. Uh, the court did say that the risk to, to the public is a highly important factor, uh, but then did emphasize that it could not justify indefinite or preventative detention. Now, um, on the facts, um, uh, the Court of Appeal found um, that a period of six weeks, um, which had been allowed by the High Court, was too long considering the history of the case. And, and as I said earlier, this was a case with a, a bit of a sorry history. Um, the um, claimant had been detained uh, in December 2017, uh, and just under a year up, uh, later, the FTT granted bail. That was in August um, 2018. Um, subject to a condition uh, requiring the Secretary of State to provide Schedule 10 support. But that, that all proved rather difficult. Um, bail um, to similar effect was granted in October 2018 and again in November 2018. Um, but by the time um, of the substantive hearing in January 2019, um, the claimant was still in detention. Um, and as I say, the um, High Court um, found that um, by the time of the hearing, his, his detention had ceased to comply with the Harding Singh principles, but allowed a rather generous grace period of, uh, of six weeks. Um, and, and what the Court of Appeals said was that was far too long, um, particularly having regard to the history of the case. Um, it said that for many months, the, the, the Secretary of State had known that the claimant should have been released, albeit under strict conditions. Uh, but for, it, for, for whatever reason, those arrangements had fallen away and the necessary steps had not been taken. Um, the court noted that it was clear from the High Court's judgment that a proper understanding of these difficulties uh, and some sympathy with them had brought the judge to conclude um, that the detention up to the date of hearing was lawful. But in the Court of Appeals view, the repeated failure to arrange release into secure conditions uh, was relevant to what further period can, could properly be regarded as lawful. Um, and it was also relevant that at the time of the trial, um, the Secretary of State had still not produced any evidence as to how uh, the claimant might safely um, be released. Uh, and there were still no arrangements, in fact, um, uh, uh, after some 14 months of detention. Um, uh, and uh, the court concluded um, that, as I say, six weeks was far too long, uh, and, a, and a grace period of around two weeks from the date of judgment um, would have been ample. Um, and what's quite useful about this case um, is um, the, the Court of Appeals signal um, that in future, uh, when, a question of, of a, when the question of a period of grace arises, uh, the Secretary of State should be expected to advance some evidence and make considered submissions as to what period is appropriate and why. Uh, in my experience, um, the uh, argument, issue of, of grace periods does tend to be somewhat neglected. Um, and that's understandable because um, the natural focus of the parties will uh, be on the prior question, namely whether um, there's been a, a breach of um, cardial sync. Uh, but what the Court of Appeal says is that, uh, at least as far as the Secretary of State is concerned, uh, she should uh, be advancing some evidence and making considered submissions. Um, so in practice, that, that, that is likely to mean that it, it's not simply enough for the Secretary of, the Secretary of State to say uh, a period of four weeks, um, uh, we should be afforded a period of four weeks grace. Um, because um, arrangements, uh, because it's rather difficult to to secure the appropriate accommodation without at least providing some evidence um, of that. Uh, a case um, um, which um, followed closely um, after the judgment in the Court of Appeal um, was a case called SB Ghana. Um, there, the High Court found um, the claimant's detention ceased to comply with the third principle on the 16th of April. 
2019. Um, and in the light of the Court of Appeals decision in, in, in AC Algeria, um, the court invited submissions on um, what grace period, if any, the Secretary of State should be afforded. Um, and if you look at the judgment, um, there are, there were, um, what I would describe as focused and um, considered submissions by both parties uh, as to what, uh, if any, grace period ought to be allowed to the Secretary of State, which, as I say, in my, is a bit of a, from my experience, is a bit of a departure. Um, the Secretary of State uh, in that case um, was arguing that um, uh, she should be afforded a, a grace period of four weeks. Uh, and that was because um, the claimant was a sexual offender um, who required accommodation approved by the probation service because that was a, a condition of his license. Um, and uh, she relied on what happened in reality because the claimant had been released from detention, in fact, in July 2019, um, to accommodation that had been approved by the probation service, but, but it all took about a month. So on that basis, she was saying, um, uh, the appropriate grace period was four weeks. Um, the court decided that that was far too long um, and that the appropriate grace period was two weeks. Uh, and so it followed that the claimant's detention ceased to be lawful on um, the 30th of April 2019 when the grace period expired. So as I say, nothing particularly earth shattering um, in the judgment in AC Algeria. Um, it, in a sense, it, it's simply be a restatement of the principles that everyone was working to, um, but it, it does, as I say, contain some useful observations and, and a particularly useful signal about what's to be expected from the Secretary of State. Um, moving then um, to public law errors uh, and uh, the impact of uh, public law errors on um, the lawfulness of detention, uh, as I'm sure you all know, um, the general principle the general, uh, which um, is often attributed to lumber, um, is that not all public errors will result in detention being unlawful, uh, only those where uh, the error is material, um, i.e. Um, where it bears on and is relevant to the decision to detain. Um, uh, an issue, sorry, an issue that arose in a series of cases, including um, DN Rwanda, um, is um, whether detention pending deportation was unlawful, where the decision to make a deportation order uh, was made in breach of the rule of public law. Um, now, the facts of, um, it's useful, I think, briefly considering um, the, the particular circumstances in, in which, which those cases arose. Um, they concerned um, deportation decisions uh, against um, refugees. Um, under the Refugee Convention, um, a deportation order um, or a, a refugee can be removed or, um, or expelled where there are reasonable grounds for regarding, as a uh, for regarding them as a danger to the security of the country. Uh, and what, the, uh, what had been um, enacted was uh, delegated legislation, um, um, we'll call it the 2004 order, um, which specified several offences which were said to be particularly serious crimes. Uh, so in other words, if you committed one of the crimes that was um, specified in that order, uh, you were rebuttably presumed to have been guilty of a particularly serious crime and constituted a danger to the community, meaning um, that you could be expelled under the um, Refugee Convention. Uh, and it was on that basis um, that, uh, so in reliance on um, that 2004 order, that deportation decisions and, and, and orders had been made against the claimants in these cases. Um, that order was then um, later declared in a case called EN Serbia to be ultra virus and unlawful. Um, so it naturally followed um, that um, de any deportation um, that was made um, based on that order uh, was um, also unlawful and in fact it was invalid. Um, um, so the question was um, what impact, if any, did that have on um, the lawfulness of um, the detention of those that were 
um, detained on foot of deportation decisions that were made um, under that um, ultra-virus order. Now, you would have thought that the answer to the, that question um, is relatively straightforward, um, given that um, uh, the decision to, there's a direct co correlation between the decision to detain, uh, sorry, the decision to make a deportation and the decision to detain, because without the de decision to make a deportation order, there is simply no legal basis uh, for, for the Secretary of State for the Secretary of State to detain. Um, but uh, in fact, the, the position was um, somewhat complicated by um, the Court of Appeals decision in Frege, um, which we'll look at very shortly. Uh, but what that effectively did was fashioned a, a, a carve out from the general rule. So in other words, the Court of Appeals said um, that the, the general rule or principle, which is at the top of the slide, um, um, wasn't necessarily determinative of whether um, detention was unlawful. In DN Rwanda, um, the Court of Appeal um, considered itself bound by Draeger uh, and so um, found that the uh, detention of the claimants wasn't unlawful. Um, uh, the Supreme Court, um, and, and this is really the significance of the decision, um, decided that Draeger was wrongly decided uh, and in fact detention, um, which was um, someone that was detained on foot of a deportation decision made under the 2004 order had been unlawfully detained. Um, in order to understand um, DN Rwanda, uh, I think it's helpful to understand um, the case of Draga. I'll deal with it relatively briefly. Um, it is a, a difficult decision in, in some respects because the reasoning is um, rather with respect to the Court of Appeals, rather convoluted. Um, but essentially, um, the Court of Appeal um, accepted um, that an unlawful deportation decision did bear on and was relevant to the decision to detain. Um, without it, there could not have been a decision to detain. Um, but in the Court of Appeals um, view, this approach didn't pay um, sufficient regard to the statutory scheme as a whole, um, which included a right of appeal to the FGT uh, against a deportation decision. And the Court of Appeal thought that in order to give effect to the statutory scheme and also in the interests of finality, um, there was a, a case for treating the FTT's decision as determinative of the lawfulness of the decision before. So what that meant in Mr. Draeger's case is that he had exercised uh, his right um, to appeal um, the decision to deport uh, and had done so unsuccessfully. This was before the judgment in Nien, Serbia. Uh, and the Court of Appeal said that um, the Secretary of State was entitled to rely on the lawfulness of the decision to make a deportation order as determined uh, on, uh, on the statutory appeal as lawful authority for Mr. Drake's detention. Uh, so in other words, um, uh, that period of detention wasn't unlawful. Uh, but what about after the judgment in Ian Serbia? So once the Court of Appeal in EM Serbia had declared um, the statutory instrument under which the decision had been made uh, to be unlawful, um, what had happened in Mr. Draga's case is after the judgment in EM Serbia, the Secretary of State had been invited um, by his uh, legal representative um, to revoke the deportation order, um, but the Secretary of State had refused um, to do so, although uh, relying on different grounds um, to those uh, which she, on which she had originally lied. So she, she was now saying, well, um, uh, you, so she was no longer relying on the, on the order, but she had made a cessation order um, on the basis um, that um, the, uh, uh, Mr. Draga's conduct fell within the scope of Article 1F. Um, the Court of Appeal thought that uh, from this point, uh, Mr. Draga's continued uh, detention had become unlawful. Um, although um, different members of the court gave slightly different reasons for, for this conclusion. Um, now, what are, what DN, um, now before I get on to what DN Rwanda does, I should just add um, that um, you might have thought um, that the case of um, Draga was conf largely confined to its particular context. 
um, particularly given the um, Court of Appeals reasoning, but in fact it was applied and relied on in a range of contexts, um, and I give two examples there. Um, Indian Rwanda, um, uh, the Supreme Court in a sense took things um, back to basics. Um, it held that um, DN's detention was unlawful from the start as a result of the illegality of the 2004 order on which um, deportation action against him was based. Um, it disagreed with the Court of Appeal in Lumber, saying that the principle, uh, sorry, in Drager, saying that the principle in, in Lumber applied with full force and effect to the circumstances of the case. Uh, and applying that principle, um, the Supreme Court um, concluded that detention was um, uh, entirely dependent on the decision to deport because without that decision, the question of detention could not rise to less be legal. And so the detention was inevitably tainted by public law error. Um, there, it's, there have been um, a number of recent cases um, which um, are useful to look at just as uh, applications of, of the number principle. Uh, one is the case uh, of Hamati in the Secretary of State, um, which concerned um, detention uh, of claimants detained, um, uh, sorry, detention uh, of those um, who were subject to procedures under the uh, transfer procedures under the Dublin Three regulation. The Dublin Three regulation um, has a specific um, provision relating to detention. Uh, Article 28, um, which provides that a person subject to procedures under the regulation can be detained where there, there is a significant risk of absconding. And that's defined in the regulation as the existence of reasons in an individual case based on objective criteria defined by law to believe a person might abscond. Now, the Supreme Court in Hamati found that um, Chapter 55 of the um, uh, EA, EIG, which is uh, which uh, is the um, Secretary of State's detention policy uh, did not satisfy these requirements. Now we know that since, of course, um, a statutory instrument has been um, uh, introduced which um, does set out um, criteria, but at the time of Mr. Hamati's detention, um, the, the policy that applied was Chapter 55. Did it mean that the claimant's detention was unlawful? Um, Yes, um, the Supreme Court was in no doubt about that um, and, and in no doubt that the test in number had been met. Um, the observation was made that there was a requirement for a binding provision of general application containing objective criteria uh, and that was not satisfied by uh, Chapter 55. This was fundamental to the decision to detain uh, and therefore detention was unlawful. Um, Another context in which this issue uh, arises um, is um, certification decisions made under the EEA regulations. Um, as you'll know, um, under the EEA regulations, um, when a removal decision is made, um, the Secretary of State can certify the removal, which allows her to remove um, uh, the uh, applicant um, pending uh, an, their appeal, pending them lodging an appeal. Um, but uh, the, the issue that has arisen uh, in a number of cases uh, and it is likely to continue to arise is whether a public law error in a certification decision um, can render detention unlawful. In a case called Lausicus, um, the um, uh, it was a judgment um, by Mr. Justice Fordham. Uh, he took the view that if the error, uh, which in that case was a, um, a misdirection in law about the appropriate test, if the error was material to the certification, this would be a public law breach which bore on the decision to de detain. But then, uh, but he considered on the facts it was not material as the decision would have been the same regardless of the error. Um, now, query whether that's consistent with um, Lumber, um, in which um, Lady Hale said that um, the breach of public law duty must be material to the decision to detain, um, but this is not the same thing as saying that the result would have been different had there been no breach. 
Um, Lausikas, the High Court's decision in Lausikas was appealed to the Court of Appeal, but this particular point wasn't appealed. Um, now, another, uh, as a, one of, as, as I said earlier, this is an issue that's um, likely to continue to arise because of the Court of Appeals decision in Hafiz, um, which uh, was um, a case in which the Court of Appeal, sorry, the High Court found um, that uh, a decision to certify under the EA regulations was uh, a measure restricting freedom of movement uh, on grounds of public policy and as such um, the standards in article 27 of the citizen direct citizens directive applied and what that means in practice is the secretary of state has to when um, making a, a removal decision sorry make when certifying the removal decision the secretary of state has to review the conduct of an individual and then apply a, a individualized proportionality to uh, that wasn't being done uh, before. Um, the Secretary of State has quite recently, I think in April, um, published new guidance, caseworker guidance, um, which reflects the judgment in her fees and requires caseworkers to carry out individual proportionality assessments um, before making um, a decision to certify. Uh, and the policy also requires any certification decisions um, taken um, before the judgment in Hafiz to be withdrawn and to be reconsidered in light uh, of the new guidance. Uh, so one of the issues that will obviously arise is whether um, those um, who uh, was, were the subject of pre-Hafiz certification decisions um, and were detained um, on the back of those certification decisions, whether their detention is unlawful. I understand there are a number of cases in the pipeline, um, and I would have thought there's a, a respectable argument for saying that um, a public law error in the, in the certification decision, um, in this case, a failure to carry out uh, um, or apply the uh, proportionality test and apply the standards in Article 27, uh, was a, is a public law error that um, bears on it and is relevant to the decision to detain where, where someone is detained um, uh, for removal uh, because um, there is in their case a certification um, which permits the Secretary of State to remove them pending an appeal. So those are, those are cases um, to watch out for. Hasta, I'm just a bit worried about time, so can we finish up? Yes, sorry. Um, I'm I'll be very quick. Um, ZA Pakistan, um, this is a case where um, um, the, the, the Court of Appeal uh, made a number of points uh, about what should happen um, to a case where, um, uh, where, where the detainee is released um, before the unlawful detention um, receives substantive consideration in the admin court. Um, and um, no doubt, um, again, that there's nothing particularly earth shattering um, in it, but it, it's a useful reminder um, that all parties should be given, given, should give timely consideration to the issue of transfer from the admin court when issues of continuing detention have been resolved. Uh, and the Court of Appeal set out um, the various advantages, again, nothing earth shattering to both parties um, uh, to a transfer to, to the county court or the QBD um, once um, uh, uh, the uh, issues uh, of continuing detention have been resolved. And the only remaining issue is, is really uh, a claim for damages. So I'll, I'll pass on to Ben. Uh, who's going to talk about um, damages for unlawful, for unlawful immigration detention. Thanks very much, Tafsa. And I'm uh, conscious uh, that time is uh, against me. So just to let you know, you will get all of these slides, I think, emailed to you. So if I can't cover everything in detail, you should have enough on the slides to go off. Um, just hoping to, there we go, um, get the PowerPoint working. So I'm going to talk to you about um, the principle of damages. Um, it's quite a technical principle, but it's quite helpful to know um, how these claims are, are made out. Um, 
The structure, as you can see, is there. So we talked to you about substantial versus nominal damages. There's been a bit of case law on that. Talked to you about the different types of compensatory damages, exemplary damages, human rights damages briefly. And then I'm going to take you through, uh, if I have time, some uh, recent authorities where you can see how the court has gone about calculating um, the quantum of damages in particular cases. So some points on substantial and nominal damages. Um, the courts have determined, um, and Lumber is usually cited as the principal authority, that where a, um, a claimant has um, up the Secretary of State is able to show that they would have been lawfully detained um, uh, in any event, then they will only be entitled to nominal damages. So um, if, if the Secretary of State has said, well, e e notwithstanding the error of law I made, um, I would have still been entitled to detain the, um, the claimant then, you'll only get nominal damages as opposed to substantive. And so clearly it's a very material issue. Now, the way the court approaches this is first of all, um, the, it's not a test of inevitability. So the Secretary of State doesn't need to show that, it, that she would have inevitably detained the claimant. Um, just the balance of probabilities, as one might expect, the burden of proof falls to the Secretary of State. And the question the court must answer is, would the Secretary of State have detained, not could? So it's not a question of, could a reasonable Secretary of State have detained um, the claimant, but would, in those circumstances, would the Secretary of State have detained um, the claimant? And um, it's important to note, as you see in, in Lazarus there, that the question of damages um, are there to compensate the claimant. And this is really what sort of underlies the principle of the substantial versus nominal damages distinction. Damages are to compensate the claimant for some wrongdoing, not to punish um, the uh, or, or express disapproval of the state's action. So the point is that if, if the Secretary of State can show that the claimant hasn't actually lost out by this legal error because the claimant would have been detained anyway, um, then uh, th there's, there's no basis upon which the court can, can provide any kind of redress to the claimant. And uh, Hafsa talked about the case of Hamati just now, it's quite an interesting case factually. In that case, the Secretary of State raised an argument that um, had it, uh, I mean, as Hafsa explained, that the law had changed after that case had been brought. So the Secretary of State now had regulations that were compliant with the EU um, directive. The Secretary of State argued that it could have and would have detained the claimants in that case. Um, it could have met the criteria in the new regulations. And therefore, had that been the law at the time, the claimants would have been lawfully detained and therefore they should only get uh, nominal damages. And, and the Supreme Court rejected that argument. I mean, it's an unusual case, but it's quite an interesting point that um, uh, Clearly, uh, um, yes, you can't argue that damages would be nominal in circumstances where the detention would have been lawful if the law had been different. It's probably obvious, but um, quite an interesting case, probably unlikely to be repeated. Now, the different heads of loss um, uh, are set out there. So um, you've got your basic award uh, for general damages, and that's, as I said, to compensate the uh, claimant for um, the loss of liberty and everything that falls from that. So in injury to feelings, their dignity, reputation, the way it generally works is you will get a high award for the initial shock of detention generally, and then it will taper off. So you, so you will get say 5,000 for day one, but you know, for day hundred, you, you might get, you know, 100 pounds. That's a sort of principle upon which it's worked. Then you can get damages for personal injury as well. So if you sustain any um, physical psychiatric injury in the course of your detention, uh, you can include a claim for damages about that. Um, if you do so, be aware of the various practice directions that apply to bringing um, personal injury damages claims. You know, in particular, you need to attach and serve evidence of a medical practitioner with your claim um, and in terms of valuing them, the Judicial College guidelines, which you can find on Lawtel, are, I think are, good, are a good starting point. They usually give you, they give you various different injuries and a sort of bracket for uh, damages that you um, would most likely be entitled to in those circumstances. Then what you would usually do is look at um, other decided cases. 
uh, on that question. Um, and uh, when you're doing that, it's important that you look at point three, which is to adjust damages for inflation and the Simmons and Castle uplift. So um, obviously any, uh, any quantum claim that's decided, you know, eight years ago um, will have to be adjusted for inflation. And again, Lawtel has a quite a helpful calculator that enables you to do that. Uh, in, in addition, I think it's all cases after 2013 are subject to a 10% uplift following the changes to costs. Um, in, in, in 2013, so you're very helpful uh, in allowing you to do that. It's a good tool. Then you've got the question of aggregate ag aggravated damages. Um, they are still compensatory damages, um, but they're awarded where there's something going beyond um, you know, the damages that you might get for the mere loss of liberty involved. So um, it, it might be because of the circumstances of the, of the way in which you're arrested and the way in which the Secretary of State conducted litigation that sort of aggregated the circum aggravated the circumstances that you found yourself in. And then you have a final category of special damages, which is where you've suffered some sort of pecuniary loss. So loss of income is, is a good one, damage to property, maybe in the course of your arrest, something like that. And again, note the practice direction that requires you to specify those um, uh, in your claim. Now, um, uh, yes, uh, then there's the question of exemplary damages, uh, which are slightly different because they are to be punitive rather than compensatory. So they are to punish um, the unsuccessful defendant. And you can see it's, they are quite unusually awarded. Um, and I think it's, it's um, well, you can see the quotations there from um, Rooks and Barnard and, and, and Musa. Um, it's outrageous conduct that you're looking at. Um, and uh, one reason can be a, a failure to comply with the duty of candor. But again, it is a high bar that you're looking at for exemplary damages and it's rarely awarded. Then you've got the question of human rights damages. Now, it's still, I think, a little unclear really to what extent they add to um, unlawful detention claims because the you can see from Section 8 of the Human Rights Act that the court, when determining whether to award damages, it has to have regard to any other relief that's already been granted. And so your common law damages for unlawful detention will be factored in and most likely or, 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 or usually to um, be appropriate to, to afford just satisfaction um, in those cases. But still, it's worth pleading. Um, it's, another, it's another angle. Then uh, some uh, older authorities um, Thompson is one which is um, regularly cited. It set out some general principles and rules for calculating damages. That's where the um, tapering principle uh, comes from. I think in that case, um, it was said that a person should get, um, I think it's 500 pounds for the first hour. Um, of imprisonment, three thousand pounds for the first twenty-four hours, but then it slowly uh, reduces after that. So that's a sort of a reasonable starting point if you're looking to advise um, a client or plead a, a quantum a damages claim. Uh, and it uh, it, it also um, set out that the assessment of damages has obviously got to be fact sensitive. It would be a highly fact sensitive exercise. And although there are all these various principles which I've been through. Um, the court's got to take a global approach to to the to the question and, and as I said it, it includes the tapering principle uh, as well. Uh, a couple of big awards uh, that are worth going through just to explain how they come about so you've got the case of Musa uh, there and in that case the claimant was awarded £25,000 in basic damages um, and seven and a half thousand pounds for aggravated damages just being joined by a small child so bear with me one second thanks very much um sorry about that um uh where was it for 126 days in unlawful detention um and so in that case the claim was a dutch national who was originally from somalia the secretary of state 
um, detained him with a view to deporting him back to Somalia, obviously even though uh, she, she wasn't entitled to do that. Um, there are a number of procedural errors and the distress of him being faced with the prospect of returning to Somalia justified a, a high award. Um, and with uh, B, there was an award for £32,000 uh, for about six months of detention. Uh, B got aggravated damages in that case because the defendant failed to apply um, her detention centre rules and, and, um, and policies. And then just to note the case of uh, NAB as well, where a defendant's detention is prolonged because they haven't cooperated with um, their removal, that can affect and reduce. Then uh, some very brief recent cases, because I'm very conscious of time. The case of Sino, um, so uh, a very low award of damages in that case, um, 3,750 for 150 days. Um, that was appealed successfully to the Court of Appeal because there was procedural unfairness in the way that the High Court judge dealt with the first claim. He decided um, the question of quantum um, on the basis of effective a summary assessment without inviting submissions. And the Court of Appeal overturned that judgment. They didn't set a new damages sum, but they did comment that that was a surprisingly low figure and they remitted it for reconsideration. Mohammed's a slightly unusual case. You have three separate periods of detention, including time in prison um, and a possible political motivation because I think the seriousness of this uh, claimant's offending might have might have encouraged the Secretary of State to um, detain in circumstances where she might not otherwise have done. Um, but you can see some of the various factors there that the court took into account. Uh, I think a couple of things to point out are the initial shock question. So where a person, it's quite common for a person to say be detained after, immediately after completing a, a sentence in prison, there won't be the same initial shock of detention there and that will affect the damages which they're entitled to. Um, prison, some of this um, claimant's detention was in prison um, as opposed to detention centre. That was found to be a more restrictive environment and justified a high reward of damages. Um, and there's an interesting postscript in that case, um, which uh, I am um, just looking for now, but I, 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 it's worth a read, but it's, 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 it's where the, um, the judge, I think, uh, I can't remember the name of the judge, but you know, justified giving damages, um, either this, this claimant was quite a nasty person, um, but justified why the courts would give damages. And you can see a very high amount of damages in cases like this. Um, then you've got Sapkota, th just 36 days in detention, but quite a high um, award of damages uh, there and special damages as well for loss of earnings. Uh, Majewski, more recent case, um, the Secretary of State adopted an unlawful policy of deporting EEA nationals who are found to have been sleeping rough. Um, the claimant was apprehended and detained for 38 days. He had an alcohol de dependency. Um, and you can see again, you know, 6,400 for the first 24 hours, 8,400 for the remainder of the period. So a good example of the tapering principle there. Um, and then um, Halonia, exactly the same sort of case, 153 days in detention. Um, but the interesting factor of that case was that the claim was awarded £5,000 uh, worth of aggravated damages for a hunger strike. He went on hunger strike in protest at his unlawful detention. And clearly the court, having found that his detention was quite clearly unlawful, agreed that um, his having had to go on hunger strike uh, justified a um, award of aggravated damages in that case. Um, it's worth having a look at those cases for more detail, but hopefully these, this canter through these slides will have, will have given you some key principles. Uh, and with that, I shall um, hopefully hand myself back to Tim, who will take control for um, any questions, if we still got time. Great. Thanks to both of you. Um, thank you for the very good presentations. Um, I'm just going to say for Ben, uh, that's the second time in, I've seen a small child on my Zoom meeting today. Um, I don't know if that makes him feel any better. Certainly <laughs> um, so good. All right. So um, uh, a couple of very quick things. Someone has asked a question about slides by email. I think 
I don't absolutely guarantee this, but we're going to try and send anyone on the presentation on the um, who signed up for the talks. We'll send them the slides by email um, directly, but they'll be available on the website along with the kind of the video presentation as well. Um, and I know someone had a question about sound quality. I'm sorry. Um, I think experiences may differ, and I think. I mean, the sound quality, I dropped a little bit for me of one or two points. Um, on the other hand, I gather other people didn't have a problem at all. So it may be your own internet connection. I'm, a, it, it, I'm not saying that's the case. I'm sorry if it's ours, um, but we're not, it may just be the vagaries of the internet. Okay. Um, in terms of then some of the other questions that have come in, um, there was a question, um, well, a couple of questions around damages for all unlawful bail um, conditions. I'll just deal with, one of them was very specific, which was, I think, possibly sent to me privately, which is where, whether in Alex Goodman's case they're seeking uh, damages for unlawful bail al alongside other things. I'm, I'm afraid I just don't know the answer to that. The only person who can answer that is Alex, and he's no longer here, but we'll try and pick that up in the in the um, comments. But there's a more general kind of question, I think there are a couple of more general questions um, around damages for unlawful bail conditions. Um, I think the co context here is not, we know from the Supreme Court decision in Jolla that you can get damages for unlawful curfew because that will am amount to an, uh, an unlawful imprisonment in itself. But Ben, do you have any thoughts about other claims for damages for unlawful bail conditions that fall short of um, of unlawful detention in and of themselves so overly overly onerous reporting conditions that sort of thing i mean it's not something i've come across in my own experience or, or review of the reported cases that's not to say um that uh it's not possible and one would have thought theoretically it would be um but yeah beyond that i've not come across any definitive principle okay i mean it, it's something i've thought about a little bit and i've had some cases where we've added it on it's all been sort of it's not, they've all resulted in settlement and the damages for that element has been rolled up in the kind of global settlement. But I think the obvious way to try and claim them, and I'm not saying you'll get them in every case and you certainly won't get an awful lot of money, would be on the basis of a breach of Article 8 of the European Convention, because you would say, well, it's a restriction on private life um, and you want just satisfaction for that. Now that raises all sorts of questions because it's not every breach of the ECHR which results in damages. Damages under the ECHR are relatively un, ungenerous. Um, but that would be how I would do it. There may be other ways of doing it. I think someone in the comments said um, they, they had um, launched a claim. So if they want to say how, put in some comments on that, that would be great. Um, other questions? Um, I mean, the other question that I saw was around, um, and I'm probably missing lots of questions, and I'm also not looking at the chat function now, so apologies if I'm missing you out, was a question about what do you do about situations where the probation service is not granting you, um, not gr finding your client accommodation. So this will be the classically a situation where your client's been, uh, come to the first end of the first part of their prison sentence they're still on license but they're entitled to be released in principle from prison sentence immigration authorities keep detaining and so the particular question that was asked in the chat was well can you sue the probation service for for not put it putting its finger out effectively I mean I, I'll tell you how I've dealt with these issues um, but I don't think it's completely straightforward I, I don't think it's straightforward to sue the probation service because they're not responsible for detention and they're not bound to find um, accommodation to avoid detention. So it's quite hard because you've got, I'm not saying you could never have a claim, you might be able to have a claim, but they've got all sorts of resource constraints, as I know from other from other work I've done as well, not around immigration detention, especially on finding, for example, approved premises, which means that they'll be able to say, well, we're not acting unlawfully because we haven't got the resources, we just can't find the accommodation, there's nothing we can do. So the way I would deal with that situation is straightforwardly by suing the Home Office. <laughs> I mean, you can add the probation service as an interested party, but I wouldn't focus on them. And I would simply say, look, the detention's unlawful. And in particular, it's not an excuse for not releasing the person that you haven't got the approved premises or the, sorry, the, the, uh, the um, accommodation approved by the probation service. Because the Home Office or the immigration detention power 
is there for the purposes of removal. It's not there for the quite separate purpose of if you like, um, this is putting it a bit colloquially, but doing a favour to the probation services because they're not happy with the accommodation. So answer is court should release, order release, and if that means release to premises which the probation services aren't happy with, tough. That's what release you get. That's how I would put it. Now, that's never gone to kind of a full hearing, but that's how I would argue it. And it seems to me that that's the right way to look at it in principle. Don't get me wrong. As someone I think has said, I think that maybe Alex said earlier, if you haven't got anywhere for your client to go, the court is going to be very unwilling to release someone because obviously releasing someone onto a street is a problem. But as long as you can, but it, I think you can say, well, if the home office, or if, no, if the home office can't find accommodation which the probation service are happy with, or if the probation service can't find accommodation which it itself is happy with, then that's tough for the probation service. And if it wants to exercise, which it almost certainly won't do, its separate powers to recall someone who's released on license, well, that's, that's for the probation service. And call their bluff, because I don't think they'll do that. So that's how I would tend to deal with that. And in every case that, where that's arisen, whoever it is who's responsible for providing accommodation has pulled their, pulled their finger out pretty quickly and we've not had to fight it all the way to court. So that's how I'd deal with that particular issue. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that. Or, or Ben. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, I couldn't see any more, but I probably missed some. Um, I hope I've covered most of them. We probably need to wrap up quite soon. I'm just going to. I'm just going to make one observation, uh, if I may, and it's sort of half an observation, half a, a question for Hafsa if she wants to take it, but there's no uh, no pressure. Um, which is about these ca this case law around the grace period. I mean, I, I, it does seem to me that something very odd has happened with this case law because everyone can, everyone can understand the idea that when you're detaining someone, um, if there's a sudden change of circumstances, you need time to process that. You may need time to make sensible release arrangements. You may need time to take on board the change of circumstances. You know, maybe the country's closed its borders, that sort of thing. Uh, and applying the hard or sin principles to that, um, the detention doesn't become unlawful uh, just, because, um, just because the Home Office don't release person the very moment the change of circumstances happen. So a grace period in that sense, I can completely understand. But I do have a real problem and I wonder if, I don't know if it can be resolved at the High Court or Court of Appeal level now, it might be a point for the Supreme Court. I do have a real problem jurisprudentially with the idea that you can breach the Hardy or Singh principles, or indeed, as some of the cases seem to say, arrive at a point where detention itself is unlawful, uh, and then nevertheless say, well, nevertheless, you don't have to release the person because of this grace period. And sometimes the case, the case law is reflected in that way. And it seems to result in this very odd situation where having won your, a claimant having had the Hardy or Singh principles applied to him, and presumably won, in other words, having regard to all of those factors that are relevant, like prospects of committing further offences, risk, risk of responding and so forth, those factors get in, brought in at a second stage, not under the hardly or Singh principles, but a, almost a second bite of the cherry uh, for the Home Office. So I, I feel that jurisprudentially something has really gone wrong there. I'm going to be doing a case, I'm leading someone uh, later in the year, on an issue which is related to this, which we haven't touched on in these slides. Uh, which is around a, a similar sort of idea of a grace period, but specifically for people with who need not to be released, but to transfer to mental health detention. Um, I don't know what inroads we're going to be making on that, but I do think that's an interesting area uh, to think about and to keep an eye on. And even if the time is right to take to a higher court, I have I said I'd give you, I'd send me a question. I don't know if you've got any thoughts about it, but um, there we go. <laughs> okay. Um, well, unless I can see any more questions in the chat function, and apologies again to anyone I have missed who's asked a question. Um, perhaps we'll wrap up there. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you to the speakers, Ben and Hafsa, and of course Alex for excellent presentations. I hope you all found it useful. Um, I think you get an opportunity to give us some feedback. Please do, or please do anyway if we don't give you a formal form. And as we've already said, all of this will be available online in due course and, and we'll be sending some emails. So thanks again, everybody. Um, we'll, we'll end it there. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.